you would take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew chapter 3. Today I want to talk to you about experiencing a personal revival. Experiencing a personal revival. As a child, I was sitting in the auditorium of the church that I grew up in when this large, tall, big man walked up on to the stage and stood behind the pulpit and began preaching one Sunday morning. And then he ended up preaching all week long. And when he finished preaching, he would give an invitation, a time for people to respond. And you could mark it down. There were going to be people coming down the aisle to the altar. There were going to be people surrendering their life to Jesus and for salvation and rededicating their life, coming and saying, I want to follow the Lord and be obedient to Him in believer's baptism. And we would call those meetings revival meetings, and the man that I'm talking about in particular was a man who just this last week went to be with the Lord in heaven, and his name was Junior Hill, and he was a man known throughout the churches of all over the world, especially here in the United States of America, known as one of the great evangelists uh, of our day. Uh, it would be told to him that he could get up behind the pulpit, read the newspaper and say, now come forward and give your life to Jesus and the altar would just be filled. The reason people would say that about him is because, A, first, he wouldn't read the newspaper. He would open up the Word of God. But he walked with God in such a way, he had such an anointing on his life, the presence of God was so real when he preached because of the relationship he had with Jesus. He was a man that lived in revival. He lived in a personal revival in his life. And this man was, would not be the kind of man you would think that would go to churches all over the world and have thousands and thousands of people to come hear him and see thousands and thousands saved. He was a big country boy from Alabama who spoke with a little bit of a southern drawl came from humble place and lived a humble life. He didn't have, uh, really, he ended up getting honorary doctorates and things like that, but he just had a little bit of education. And yet, people would want to hear him preach and give their life to Jesus after he declared the word of God. And I remember as a child, just sitting and listening Intently to what the man of God was saying when he would come to revival and preach. Today, in Matthew chapter 3, I want to talk with you about another man that Junior Hill reminds me of. It was a man by the name of John the Baptist. Junior was an old country boy from Alabama, but John the Baptist was a wild man out in the wilderness. And he too began to preach a word from God because of this intimate walk he had with the Lord, this calling upon his life. And people were coming from all over the place to hear this wild man wearing camel hair with a leather belt wrapped around his waist, eating locust and wild honey, and they were flocking out into the desert to hear what the man of God had to say, the last prophet to come in this Old Testament period, as it was closing and as the New Testament was beginning with the Gospels, with Jesus coming, they were hearing what he would say, and people were giving their life to him. And as we look at his message, I want you to think about this truth. First, starting with me, we need personal Revival. 
And personal revival begins with repentance. Let me say that again. We, beginning with me, need personal revival. And personal revival begins with repentance. Let's look at this, starting in Matthew chapter 3. Verse 1 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Look at it, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said... I'm not unmuted. If it starts, am I on? All right. If it starts acting up, I'm going to get a different mic. The devil don't want us to hear this message today. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there since we were stopped, and I want to and I want to give a little commentary on some of this. Okay. In those days. These were the days of the ministry, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah had prophesied that there would be one that comes before Christ and he prepares the way for Christ. John the Baptist is that man, that prophet. He's out in the wilderness saying he's making the way straight, he's preparing the way, and he's saying, people get ready, the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. That is the rule of God, the kingdom of God, the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ has come. The Messiah is here. And, and after this passage, Jesus is going to come and he's going to come to where John is. And John's going to say, look, there he is. There's the son of God. There's the limb of God. There's the Messiah. There's the Savior. There's Jesus. And so John the Baptist is out there getting the people ready and they're coming to him for baptism, confessing their sins. They were being baptized by John the Baptist. Right? The first Baptist out there. I knew you would like that, right? He was the first Baptist out there. No, we don't John the Baptist, he wasn't Baptist, but he was a he was a baptizer. But if he was here today, he'd be a Baptist. Right? <laughs> and so he's baptizing. People are coming to him, and here's his message repent. That's the message. Repent. The message is, you have sin. And you need to turn from that sin. Repent. And trust in the Messiah who is coming. And people were saying, I confess my sin, and he's baptizing them. And that baptism was a way for them to outwardly display the inner change in their life. Publicly before others. The unashamed, they say, yeah. They, they were willing to say, yes, I do have sin. But I trust God and I surrender my life to him. I repent of it. And so baptize me out here in front of everybody. Because, let me give you a clue. We all know that I'm a sinner in here today. I'm not fooling anybody in this room. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. 
I know you're a sinner. And so does everyone else. You're not tricking anybody. And so they, they were willing to say, I am a sinner. And I'll go be baptized and, and, and let people know that I have, I have repented of my sin. I'm not ashamed to say I've repented of my sin. And they're coming out in flocks to John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And he is baptizing them as they are confessing their sins. And then verse 7 says, When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will gather, or he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. The reason... We're looking at this today is because, first off, God laid it on my heart. God has great plans for this church and for your life and your family. As you, as we begin a new year, As we begin a new year, all right, I'm going to get a new mic. I'll grab this one, don't worry. I said, I think it's good. Turn it off. All right, here we go. All right, as I said, this message God placed on my heart this week. And I firmly believe everything that is happening in this service, all the distractions that's going on, is because God wants to begin a work that goes beyond just today. Personal revival in our lives that begins with repentance. What is revival? What is personal revival? Well, revival is a, is a restoration. It's a it's a waking up from sleep. It's, if you will, it's waking up from sin. Revival is a passionate, enthusiastic pursuit of God. It's a longing for the things of God. It's a longing for the presence of God. It's a longing to be with God, to walk with God, to grow in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But revival in your life will only start with repentance. Repentance acknowledges and confesses sin against God. It turns and trusts in God. If we were to go and look at chapter 4, Jesus, he, he ends up coming to John the Baptist later in chapter 3, and, and he is baptized. And then Jesus goes off into the wilderness 
and he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. He fasts and he prays and he's tempted. And then at the end of that chapter, it says that Jesus begins really his public ministry. And you know what message Jesus began with? You can turn over and look at it in chapter 4. It says, and he began preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent. Repentance is that, is that word, it's that truth, it's that action that we just don't even want to talk much about. We think if we just come to church and go through the motions and just live however we want to live, but if we come and we're a part of a Bible study or, hey, we, you know, maybe we even, we've been inviting people to church or we've been, we've been trying to, you know, get things going in the right direction and, oh, man, this is going to make a big impact on me if I, if I go, maybe if I just start, if I start giving more in the offering and all these things and, and we start looking at all these ways that we're going to, we're going to change our lives by, by, by re- rearranging stuff or adding more to our lives. I, I, I want to tell you that that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. The only way any of us in here will have a true revival in our lives is if it starts with repentance. Repentance is turning from sin and trusting in God. You say, do I really need to be concerned about that in my life? Well, let me ask you, is there sin in your life today? Are you a person that over this last week or over the last month or over the last year have, have failed to come to God in repentance and ask Him to forgive you for the sin that has been in your life as of late? Sin such as pride and arrogance, greed, lust, envy. The Bible says drunkenness is sin. What about sexual immorality? Pornography. Adultery. Fornication. What about hatred in your heart towards someone else? Wrath towards other people? What about gossip? The Bible says that's sin. Have you been gossiping about other people? Well, I just do that in my own home with my family. Well, still sin. What about deceit? Have you been deceitful? Have you been lying? Are there, are there ways you've been cutting corners and trying to do things in a deceitful way? Sin is sin. And the Bible tells us, that we must be a people that repent of sin. If you've ever been driving down the interstate and gotten lost, taking the wrong exit or not taking an exit, I've been there. I'm not so good with directions sometimes. And I've been going down the interstate, especially in a place that I've never been before. And if Chelsea's not there helping me, I will flat out go right past where I'm supposed to be going. And what happens when I start going the wrong direction? Well, when I realize I've gone the wrong direction, here's what I do. And here's what you've done in the past. Ladies, you can testify your husband has missed the turn. 
And he argued with you. Oh, no, we're going the right way. Yeah, no, we're not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then finally, oh, you know, they still won't admit it, but eventually they'll turn around. And, 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 and what you do is you pull off the off-ramp onto another exit. And you pull off that exit, and then you take a turn, and you go over the overpass, and then you turn directions, and you come onto the on-ramp, and you get back on the interstate going in the other direction. That's what it looks like to repent. It is to get off the direction you're going, to turn from the sin that's in your life, Get off, turn around, and go the complete opposite direction. Now, here's the, here's the reality for you today, friends. When you are driving down the road and you are start going the wrong direction, isn't it much better to take the exit and turn around faster or sooner rather than later? I mean, who wants to drive 500 miles in the wrong direction? Nobody. I mean, if, if it's the next exit down, you can get over and turn around. That's a lot better than going 500 miles in the wrong direction. What the Bible is teaching us is that as soon as sin creeps into our life, we need to repent of it. And we need to turn and go in a different direction. God's way. Not only that. I'm fairly certain today there are people in this room that you have sin in your life that's been there for years. It's been there for months. And you just keep you just going to keep going down that road. What God wants to do in your life is he wants you to repent. It doesn't matter how far down the road you are. You can get off right now. Acknowledge your sin. Confess your sin. Turn and acknowledge God and go his direction. The worst thing you can do in your life today is to keep ignoring sin and just going the way that you want to go even though it's the wrong direction. See, revival in your life is not going to happen if you have unconfessed sin that you are unwilling to repent of. It's not going to happen. You will not experience all that God wants you to experience in your life if you have sin in your life that you are unwilling to repent of. Hey, if you're here today and you have given your life to Jesus Christ for salvation, and you are saved, and there is sin in your life, I'm telling you right now, there is discipline that's going to come your way. There will be consequences to that sin, even as a child of God. You need to turn around and go the direction God wants you to go. If you're here today, and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ for salvation, it's really simple. All you must do is repent of your sin and turn to the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Revival can only happen in your life with repentance. Revival is not religion. It's a relationship. Personal revival doesn't begin by trying to 
do a bunch of things under the title of religion. Revival in your life is about a relationship. See, John the Baptist here, he calls out some people in verse 7. He calls out these Pharisees and Sadducees. You know who those people were? They were the religious people of the day. They were the day that strutted while sitting down. That's how prideful they were. I mean, you could just look at them. I mean, they, they, they wanted everybody to know just how great they were. This is how religious they were. This is how awesome they were. This is how much better than they were than everyone else. Hey, they went to, if we were to say it today, hey, they went to church on Sunday. And they looked out in the neighborhood and they said, man, most of this neighborhood isn't even going to church. Look how great I am. I went to church today. They were the religious people. They looked down upon everyone else, and, and, and they thought that, that they were something because of the religion that they had. But when John the Baptist sees them come, and he calls them out, and he says, you, you brood of vipers. They were concerned about these works that they were doing. But revival and salvation is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Repentance must be a lifestyle to live in a personal revival, constantly crucifying the flesh and its evil desires. If you're going to have personal revival in your life, if you're going to be a person that, that lives in continual repentance, did you know that was such a thing? Did you think repentance was just something you did one time when you came to faith in Jesus Christ? God has called us to be a people of repentance, a lifestyle of repentance, turning from our sin when sin creeps and enters into our life. You live at the foot of the cross, be at the feet of Jesus. This lifestyle of relationship, that's why we emphasize personal time with God in the Bible. Bible study and prayer and walking with God and being with Him is so we can grow in our relationship so that the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin in our life and we'll turn that over to Him in repentance. The enemy is always trying to drive a wedge between you and the Lord. Salvation is about your relationship with Jesus Christ, with God Almighty. And the devil, he is constantly at work to drive a wedge between you and Jesus. Did you know that? What's a wedge do? Well, some people will take a wedge when they're splitting wood. They're trying to split wood for a fire. And so what they'll do is they'll take a wedge... And they'll find a crack in a log, and they'll, they'll try to station that wedge at the top of that crack. And then they'll take a sledgehammer and drive that wedge down into that log to then split the wood. That's what a wedge does. It separates th things from one another. It separates. It splits things off. And so a wedge is driven in to split off one thing from another, to separate objects. And so as we, as we think about how a wedge separates objects, I want you to understand that's exactly what the devil is trying to do in your life between you and Jesus. He's trying to get a wedge driven between you and Jesus to separate you in your personal daily walk with him so that you... Don't want to read your Bible. Anybody, don't raise your hand. Anybody struggle to read their Bible? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. You know why you struggle to read your Bible? I'm, about to, I'm telling you, I'm about to give you a breakthrough. But it's not what you want to hear. You struggle to read your Bible because of sin in your life.
Does anybody in here struggle to pray? You struggle to pray because of sin in your life. Do you, have you ever found yourself in a place where you struggle to come to worship, to worship Jesus? You're like, I, I just don't know if I want to go today. Or you don't go for a long time or whatever. You, you want to know why you struggle? Why I struggle? That's right. Sin. Sin. Here's what the devil does. He finds a crack in your life, and he takes a wedge, and he sits it on that crack. Now, here's the thing. The devil can't drive the wedge into you. Did you know that? The devil can't drive the wedge into you. He sits it there. you got to take the sledgehammer and drive it in yourself. And so what he does is that wedge is a sin, and he, he finds a crack in your life, and he takes that sin, and he puts it right there in the crack, and it's a temptation. And you start looking at that, you start thinking about that, and then you have, you have the opportunity to not give in to it. You don't have to give in to that sin. You don't have to give in to that temptation. But so often what you do is you grab that sledgehammer, and you drive that wedge between you and the Lord. By giving in to that temptation and sinning. And when you sin, that wedge has been driven in between you and Jesus. And it causes this wedge in your life that makes you have less of a desire to walk with Him. Less of a desire to be spiritually renewed. Less of a desire to read your Bible. Less of a desire to pray to Him. You begin this process of even avoiding God, avoiding the Lord, avoiding His way, avoiding His people. The reason you struggle so much to have revival in your life is because of sin. Sin makes you want to avoid God. Now, some, some of us, we've just gotten real good at living with sin in our life. I mean, we've just, we, we've almost perfected living with sin. The church in America has almost perfected living with sin that we can come to church on Sunday and act like everything is okay in our life. We can go to our Bible study group. We can do this and we can do that and just live however we want to live to where we, we just don't even feel anything. But in the reality, while it might look okay on the outside, there is something terribly wrong on the inside. There's something missing on the inside. We are struggling in our walk with Jesus Christ and it's because of sin. Sin makes you want to avoid God. Maybe you've been there before with a relationship. Maybe it's been with a spouse. Maybe it's been with a friend. Maybe it's been with a teacher or a coach or a coworker, where you've done something. You said something you shouldn't have said. You did something you weren't supposed to do. You know you messed up. I know I've been there to where I've done something like that, and then I start avoiding that person. I see him at the grocery store. I'm going the other way. I don't, you know. I did it to my spouse, and so now we're not talking. Just because you just want to avoid it. And then thankfully somebody told you in, in premarital counseling that never to go to bed angry at one another. And so, so finally... At 12 o'clock, when you're like, I got to go to sleep, you, you start finally talking to your wife just so you can make up. Because somebody told you along the way, don't go to bed angry. And so you, you, you did something to someone, and then you start avoiding that person. And that's exactly what happens in your relationship to Jesus. When you have sin in your life, it causes you to avoid him. And you might be tricking other people, but, but you know in your life today that there is something wrong. And it's a sin. 
It's a specific sin. It's a real sin. It's something that you have done and are doing against the Lord. And so, if you want to experience a revival in your life, it's going to start. It will not start before you come clean before Almighty God and you confess your sin to Him and you repent of your sin. Now, I'm just going to close with this. We see... In this passage of Scripture, that there are, there are fruits consistent with repentance. He says in verse 8, talking to those Pharisees and Sadducees, he's saying, you guys haven't repented. Because your life doesn't have the markers of genuine repentance. There is a fruit consistent with repentance. When you repent, there are things that change in your life. But I just want to give you what I believe is is the the most important, most powerful fruit in repentance for your life. And it all comes back to this thing about relationship with Christ. You see, salvation is not about religion. It's about a relationship. Repentance is not about religion. Repentance is about getting right in your relationship to Jesus Christ, to God Almighty. And in John chapter 15, Jesus talks to his disciples and he tells us this truth. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who abides or remains in me and I in him, he produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Are you abiding in Jesus today? Are you walking with God daily? Is He changing your life? Are you bearing the fruits of repentance? The only way you will bear the fruits of repentance in your life is if you are abiding with Jesus. And I'm telling you today, you will not abide with Jesus if you have sin in your life. You'll avoid Him. You'll read your Bible and you won't come away with anything. You'll pray and you'll feel as if you hadn't even spoken to God. But if you will repent of whatever sin is in your life and you'll daily repent and you'll live a lifestyle of repentance, you will begin to walk with God and abide with Jesus Christ. And he says, when you abide in me, he will produce much fruit in your life. See, you can't do it. But you got to have the power of God in your life. I'm going to ask David if you'd just come on up here. Right there, right there where you're sitting. David, you can go ahead and start playing whenever you're ready. Here's what I want you to know. Sin is a reality. Sin is a reality. Maybe you have never repented of sin in your life. Let me say it again. Maybe you have never repented of sin ever in your life. You can't be saved apart from repenting of your sin and trusting in Jesus Christ. And so if you've never repented of your sin and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I have got some great news for you today. That's the whole reason why Jesus came. He came to die on the cross for your sins so that by His grace through faith, as you repent of your sins, you can be forgiven. You can have salvation. You can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will save you today. There is not a sin in your life. There is not a sin in this world that is greater than God's love and grace. So whatever it is, 
you think it's small, if you think it's big, you need to bring it to Jesus. And if you'll bring it to him, and you'll lay it at his feet in repentance, and you trust in him by faith, you will be saved. Perhaps today, God has convicted you of a sin. Maybe multiple sins that have driven a wedge in your relationship with God. You know, the relationships, they can be difficult. And maybe you're in this place, this season where because of that sin in your life, you know you've not been walking with God like you should be. You're avoiding Him. Man, I got some good news for you. The Bible, Jesus tells us a story of this person. He just called the prodigal son, sinned against his father greatly. He went off. He just about ruined his entire life. In fact, he was living in the pig pen. He was dirty, filthy. He had squandered the inheritance that he had already taken from his father. And then he said, you know what, I'm just going to go back home. Maybe, maybe, maybe my father will receive me some way. You know what he found when he came back to his father's house? He found his father was waiting. His father was looking. His father came running to him, and his father embraced him. He said, welcome home, son. Welcome home. I know there is shame and sin, and there should be shame and sin, but I got real good news for you. There's forgiveness. There is a loving father, a father of power and of grace and of might, who has his arms open today, and he is simply saying, come on. I'm here. I'm waiting. Take my embrace. I'll forgive you. I'll renew. I'll restore this relationship. I'll begin a revival in your life that's going to be unlike anything you've ever experienced. You've got to come to Him in repentance. I want you to just bow your heads right there where you are. We're just going to, this is how we're going to close today. We've run out of time. And I know that often I give an invitation. Sometimes people come forward. Sometimes people don't. Maybe today God is dealing in your life in a real way. And I don't want to hinder you from getting right with God. I want you right there where you are seated right now to get right with God. If you've never repented of sin, right there where you're sitting, just start praying to God and say, God, I repent of my sin, and I trust in Jesus for salvation. You just pray to him right there where you're at, and he'll save you. Today, you know you have been saved, but you've been living in sin right there where you're at. You right now need to confess that sin. You need to come clean before God. You need to turn from it, and you need to start going the direction God has called you to go in. Father, We thank you for your grace and goodness to us. And I just ask you, God, by your mercy, begin a work in our lives today. David, keep playing, please. Thank you. God, as the people in this room pray, hear their prayer. I know you do.
every head is bowed and every eye is closed, and I'm not, I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you in any way. But if you today repented of your sin for the very first time and trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation right there where you're seat, seated, you do need to let you need to let somebody know. And you don't need to be ashamed of it. And so I'm just going to ask you, I'm looking, I'm the only one looking right now. I'm just going to ask you if you would look up at me and, and put your hand up in the air. Don't be ashamed. Look up at me and put your hand up. If you've never repented, yes. Yes, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Yes, thank you, brother. Yes, thank you, sister. I see you. Thank you. You can put your hand down, yes. Yes. I just want to give you a word to those that lifted your hand and looked up here at me. That I, I've, I'm going to be praying for you. And if you trusted in Christ for salvation, you repented of your sin. He saved you today. and We rejoice in that. And I'm going to find you. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you. But I'm going to find you today or sometime. I'm going to talk to you just so I can help you on this journey that you're on. Listen, I know that, I know we're way over time today. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to pray. And David's going to keep playing. And when I finish praying, if you, if you got, if you need to leave because you've got a reservation somewhere, you can go. But if you need to come to this altar and pray, then you can, you can pray. Father, I thank you for the lives that were changed today. For those that repented and trusted in you for salvation. And Lord, we just pray that this will be the beginning of a revival that you begin in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. If you would just stand to your feet. Like I said, if you need to go, you can go. If you need to come to the altar and pray, you can come to the altar and pray. If there's anybody that sticks around, then I'll, I'll close this in a minute. But this is an opportunity for you.